How's it? You gotta put this. Oh well. I don't know. Okay. Fine. My great federal state. Don't be worried about. The same city in Israel. Do you have family well, there? So do you go back to visit every once in a while? Yes. Yeah. 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 American, so bad geography. I'll have to look at the map on your wall. Next you like Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, the is the Volsing Hades. Red Seams. Why do we just see Clay Watkins? Clay Watkins. Okay. It's a surprise. Then, and oh, I see. Kind of like where the peninsula stretches out, but then more on the but we can't here. Oh, yeah, 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 um, I went someone from Israel. Somebody offered me a trip to, to Europe. It was really, they were going to Uman to Rosh Hashanah. Oh, so you flew through Riga to Uman? Exactly. Why through, through, through from Riga to Warsaw? Oh, that uh, trip to Uman. It was, it was, it was, it was wild. It was very wild. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. It was the picture this year. It's it's crazy. It was it's unlike anything I've ever been. We normally people like prepare to go there. We did. We just ended up buying a ticket from Warsaw. Uh, to uh, oh, no, in fact, it's definitely because, yeah, the war is going on, he's not quite here. Yeah, but people are still going, like, yeah. yeah. huh? people are still going, like, it's still like, yeah. But now the distance is complicated, so yeah, yeah. Last year, they used in their house, Moldova, the ability to pop, and then pop, and then pop, and close to seven, maybe. Oh, gotcha. Now, the Moldovan government, they decided to let go. Wait, so, I think they're, yeah. they're nervous that Russia's going to get upset, or you know, yeah, because at least in my month, huh, they thought sustainability and Israel have obligations right, to invest in the airport. Oh, okay. Twitter. It's your okay, friends, your country. We just want to use, yeah, like, the airport. Um, let's still get into business. <laughs> yeah, no, yeah. So, uh, Pretty just to. Firm. Let right. you know what's going to happen. Send it like for most. Rachel Berry is going to introduce the entire year. Well. And then uh, we're going to have a conversation, a very candid conversation, honest conversation. We're going to keep it real, uh, relaxed conversation, hopefully. Um, maybe if there's time, we'll open up some questions and uh, we'll finish off with some prayers for our brothers and sisters in Israel and those that are fighting and those that are suffering. So, uh, Without any further ado, feel free, by the way, to come take food anytime. Rachel. Hello, I'm Rachel Benjamin here with my younger brother. Um, you know, he made it this far. That's good. Um, when he first went. Well, that's not my family, right? No. Um, when he first went to Israel um, for gap year or year course, um, we were all excited for him, like, go, expand your horizons, this is great, perfect opportunity. Um, I was pregnant with my son, and for his godson, but um, he came back and he was all excited and he's like, I want to join the IDF. And I'm going to Israel. I'm going to go. I'm going to live there. I want to be there. That's where I want to be. Of course, my parents were a little worried. Um, I was like, oh, do your thing. You do you. Like, this is what you want to do. I am supportive. I've been supportive. Like, if this is like, he's doing what he wants to do. So I was going to support it no matter what. Um, so I supported him. He did his turn, his, what, his service. Sorry, he did his service. He did great. Um, my parents went over there a few times for his um array ceremony. Array ceremony. Thank you. I don't know. Thank you, Ben. Um, they went for that. He was good, and then he came back, and then he's like, I'm gonna live there permanently. That's where I want to be. Again, my parents were not so okay with him. But I was like, okay, you're good. Great. He came back to visit and um last year, and then 
he called me a week before he was supposed to actually leave. And he said, I know you're not going to like this. I need a plane ticket now. I got to go. And then that's when I turned on the TV and I heard everything that was going on in Israel. And did I want him to go? No. But did I go online and buy him a plane ticket? Sure did. Because I'm the supportive sister. <laughs> so, um, and I talked to him and we were worried and we were concerned, but we kept in touch as much as we could with him and his girlfriend, Michelle, the whole time. We were calling them, video chatting whenever we could. Um, he kept the bad stuff and did not tell us that because he didn't want us to worry so much. Um, and he, in my eyes, he's, he's a hero. He is. He, um, All of our eyes. Yeah, he's, he's protecting us. He's over there fighting, doing what he needs to do, um, and pr protecting us while we're over here. Um, and it's great, and I love him for it, and uh, he's definitely my hero, and um, that's my brother. Thank you, thank you so much. Um, so first of all, thank you all for being here, such short notice. Um, it's uh, an honor to be here with Benjamin. I do want to just mention that uh, uh, when I sent out the email uh, last night, inviting everybody to this event, um, I wrote that uh, Benjamin is a you know an IDF lone soldier. He was heroic, defending our country. I got back an email from somebody that said, "I think that's anti-Semitic." I said, "Excuse me? Huh? Uh, I think that's anti-Semitic." I said, what's anti-Semitic about it? Because uh, you're telling American Jews that uh, Israel is our country. I said, uh, the Torah tells us that Israel is our country. It's our biblical homeland. Now, you know, whatever your views on government are, are irrelevant to the land of Israel, to the people of Israel, and to Klal Yisrael and Am Yisrael, which is literally our title and our name. So uh, to deny our... This was the Jewish person, by the way. But to deny our connection and our heritage to our homeland, that is what's anti-Semitic. So uh, I do want to applaud everybody for coming out today. Um, and uh, we will uh, be honest, keep it real. And um, I do want to also thank Brendan Fish from Federation for promoting it, for being here, and for really initiating this conversation. He sat down for a, I want to say lengthy podcast, but it went by quite quick with uh, Ben whilst he was even still in Israel. Um, so we're honored to have him here in the flesh, and I do want to say welcome back. How long are you here for? Sorry, technology is not the very strong suit. How long am I here for? Uh, my plan is to be here a little under a month. Uh, I just have school starting in early November, so I have to get back for that. I'm trying to finish my degree this year. Hopefully that would be, uh, be an option. Uh, I missed all of first semester last year. I got released from my, my Milloween service, which is my reserves, had 10 days, and then uh, I started my second semester. So just been trying to get all my makeup work done. Um, one thing I wanted to say before we get into more questions, uh, I want to give a big thank you to everyone here. Um, firstly, for showing up tonight. Secondly, when the war first started, um, a lot of soldiers came back to very little gear, very little available equipment. Um, my dad, my brother, my sister set up um, uh, Venmos and, you know, and um, Zelle, different uh, transactions. And all of you that donated were able to get my um, team, you know, life-saving gear. Um, it really means the world to us. We were able in two weeks to raise seventeen thousand dollars. Thank you. Follow round of applause for yourselves. That was amazing. So thank you so much. For, uh, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. So you're not here for long. No. Um, so to Rachel's point, you decided one day that you were going to live in Israel, um, and then you decided that you were going to sign up for the reserve, sign up for the idea. What made you do that? Like, what? what why? Um, so, right, so I went on my uh, gap year program, my year course, um, right after my senior year. It was never really a question whether I was going to do it. My parents, when I approached them about it, um, were even like, you're, you're going on year course, right? And like, we're not going to, to college next year. So they already knew what was going on. Um, 
and just being there for the year. Uh, we lived four months in Bat Yam. We lived an additional five months in Jerusalem. Um, and when your course ended, I was actually extremely happy. I, I loved my time, but you know, I was kind of thinking like, it's ready to get back to, to real life. This was a great break, but uh, you know, get back, go to school. Um, and something just like switched when I landed in, in Charleston. Um, something didn't feel right, which was odd, right? Because I spent 18 years living here um, prior and it was always my home. Um, and suddenly it didn't feel like that. And I knew it wasn't, you know, anything that Charleston did wrong, um, but my love for Israel was just so great. Um, so the first day I got back, uh, I'll admit I was very upset. I like cried the entire first day. I wasn't around my friends anymore. Um, and I was missing Israel big time. And um, a month into being here, it just, I felt the same. And I was really going back and forth with it. I was talking to a lot of people and, um, yeah, at the end of the day, I was like, all right, like it's my it's my place, and I found myself. The moment I came back from the Air Force, six months later, on my Aliyah flight, moving back to Israel. So December 27th, 2017 uh, was the was my Aliyah date. Um, and this year, I was able to celebrate that date inside Gaza, um, which was very interesting, a very surreal moment. Um, but yeah, I, I don't, you know, regret anything at all. Um, and it was uh, one of the best decisions I ever made. Wow. So you were 19 at the time? 20? Mm -hmm. When I made Aliyah, I was, uh, it was a month after my uh, 20th birthday, yes. Wow. Yeah, incredible. Amazing. And thank you to supportive parents. Can you okay with that? <laughs> so <laughs> when you got back just over a year ago, I mean, literally a year, a year ago now, literally, Kind of get out as quick as you can to mm -hmm. be there for your country. Mm -hmm. And I guess what was your first active duty? Is that correct? Or yeah, well, it was um, crazy that actually uh, when I, so I drafted to the army in April 2018. Um, I was drafted to a base called Michvelon. Michvelon is a place for people, you know, Olim Khadashim, new immigrants that don't really know Hebrew that well. Um, so I was surrounded by a lot of Americans, um, English soldiers, Australians, Russians, Ukrainians, um, a bunch of different uh, groups of people. Um, and then afterwards, when I finished three months there, I redrafted to the Givadi Brigade um, in August of 2018. Um, my team, because I drafted before them, I was released three months before them. Um, and I was put in a different reserve service than them. So they weren't put in reserve duty at all. I was put in a reserve service just by myself. I got a call from the commander. He's like, hey, you're with me in reserves, but you don't have a team. Um, I guess just figure it out. Um, so I did a little bit of bouncing around. In the meantime, my team fought for a year and a half uh, to get put into reserve duty. Um, so once they were finally put to a place, they were able to bring me over. And this was my first, uh, yeah, my first reserve duty since getting out. So I was like four years, no training, uh, had to learn, kind of like, had to remember everything on the fly again, which was, I mean, not super hard, but uh, it was definitely a little bit of a learning curve, especially when you're, you know, going straight into a war. Wow. So when you went into reserve duty and, and you got back there, mm -hmm. where did you go? You went to like a staging area, a regular mm -hmm. campus? Right. So I um, came back with my friend Daniel. Uh, his father picked us up and we drove to Petah Tikva. We were able to pick up a little bit of gear that he had. He had like one and a half pairs of, uh, of uniforms and he like tossed me a shirt. I didn't have anything. Um, I went, we got a, a ride back to my place with a friend. I was able to take like a 20 year old vest that I had that had, you know, didn't even have space for, um, for ceramic plates or like, you know, any kind of bulletproof uh, material. Um, and then because there was no public transportation, there wasn't a lot of people, you know, the ability to, to, to drive certain places. Um, there was volunteering um, from different Israeli civilians who were already, you know, out of reserve duty. So, I joined just a random WhatsApp group. Um, I met this uh, man who, 
a very interesting name. It's Akhav Midbal, which literally translates to Desert Scorpion. I don't know uh, how he was, I don't know how he, he obtained that name. Um, but yeah, he, he volunteered to drive me down yeah. two and a half hours to my base in the south, which is Badakhad. Badakhad is the training base for officers in the uh, army. Um, and there I received um, my gun. They gave me, you know, four uh, four uniforms, and that was about all they had. They were like, "Take this, take you know, take these four uniforms, take this gun, and take these like five magazines." And that was all I had in the beginning. And of course, the the um, not so great vest. Um, yeah, and from there, I spent uh, a day and a half there because there was no option while we were still getting our gear and trying to scrounge up wherever we could. My team was already in kibbutz rain. Um, and I was just basically waiting to get to them. Um, my first night there, uh, all of a sudden there was like this commotion and a bunch of people, you know, getting messages on their phone. They're talking about like this, uh, event that just happened. They don't know what's going on. I'm trying to call my team, no one's answering. And what I came to, the next, so the next day they were able to take me to my team, Kibbutz Rain. Like I mentioned, um, at the uh, October 7th event, you know, there was still the bullet ridden cars of Kibbutz Raim and Bayeri all across the roads. We saw all of that, the burnt cars, the erect police car that, you know, was just, um, the entire front was burnt. There was blood in the passenger seat, just completely drenched. Um, and what I had learned had happened the previous night was one of my commanders was talking to his uh, sister. And as soon as he got off the phone, he saw something on the corner of his eye. A terrorist came from behind him, covered his mouth, and tried to cut his throat. Um, him, with his fast reflexes, he lifted up the butt of his gun and hit the terrorist in the face. They fell backwards. He subsequently broke his shoulder and rolled away. He was able to yell because his mouth wasn't being covered anymore. My team came up, neutralized the terrorist, um, and you can see I took a picture, um, which Brandon has and we can pass around maybe later. Um, you can see small X, well, not so small, maybe about like a, an inch, inch and a half wide X on his neck where the knife had um, kind of like slashed a couple of times, but in his gun strap, two large gashes. Because when he lifted up his gun to him in the face, his strap covered his neck and saved his life. So I actually got back in time uh, to bench the bill note with him. And uh, yeah. Yeah, that, that was our introduction to the war. So wow. yeah, yeah, yeah. And that was on Israeli territory. Like, that, was, that, was in, like, that was in Kibbutz Raim, and they were told, you know, that it was fine, that it had already been cleared by a team of Sayyid Makal, which is one of the top, you know, three um, special forces units in the army. It was cleared by another team of uh, Sayyid Kheru, which is the special forces of the Kfir Brigade. So they thought that everything was fine. And <clears throat> we were using a makeshift we were using um a kindergarten as just like a makeshift barracks for ourselves so we we're just like sleeping on like tiny like mats in the middle of this uh this kindergarten just you know basically living out of whatever bags that we had you know that we had brought um so you you left the base you went to raim and you stayed in, in the kibbutz. we stayed in raim for a couple of days um and then when it was clear we moved on to uh Kibbutz named Shukda, which didn't have any um, any infiltrations, um, but they were still worried because again, this is the beginning of the war. When I got to Israel, Nova was still kind of being discovered. We didn't know when I got to Israel, the death toll was officially six hundred. Um, every day we were trying, you know, learning more and more and more um, how many people had actually uh, been murdered. And um, so we went to Shukda because we were still worried, you know, how many terrorists are in Israel, how far did they get? And then from Shukda, we went to Kibbutz Magen, which also didn't have any infiltration, even though they tried. Um, Magen tends to be a pretty, um, I don't want to say it, uh, like they're very paranoid. Um, so every time there's rockets, they have a transpeat, go up, by a lookout, go up and um, check the area and the Tatspit that went up, um, the Tatspitan, he saw a bunch of, um, of 
Hamas vehicles coming towards the kibbutz. So he warned the Kitat Kamanuk, which is like the go team for the uh, Noah Shatz, which is like the kind of the head of security of the kibbutz. And um, they went and neutralized 40 terrorists that were coming towards the kibbutz. Yeah. Um, the only the only injury suffered was um, the Rav Shatz, the head of the security, a uh, 60 year old man. Um, got shot in the leg. Wow. Yes, yeah, so we we stayed there for about a month and a half, um, and then we moved to we were doing Sior, uh, which is like patrol in the surrounding areas. So again, near Oz, Machane um, Raim, which is the Raim uh, base, and then we moved to a place called Inish Losha, and Inish Losha is. Um, Right behind near uh, Kibbutz Niroz. Sorry. Um, in the Shlosha is right behind there. We were in this place called Beit Levan, which was like this makeshift kind of base. We set up um, just like these tents we had. We were sleeping in shipping containers that were made into makeshift uh, rooms. And then we subsequently were doing. Um, all of our patrols and going into Gaza from there. Um, where were we? We stayed there for, um, we did that for about, that um, was five months. Five, yeah, so we were, we were in like, we were in again for that first month and a half, and then we were in Anish Shah for two and a half, three months after that. Wow. And, and during all this time, you're, you're literally not far from Gaza, depending, you know, whichever it is, what's your every, Every morning when I woke up, I can just like I could look out over our fence that we had set up around the base and look directly into Gaza. And I remember getting alerts on my phone for rockets, and mm. they were all coming to that surrounding area around Gaza. What was right. it like living there? Um, very interesting. So when I first got to Israel, there was a bunch of explosions going off, and I thought I did not know what it was. And apparently, my friends, you know, quickly um, told me they're like, no, 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 don't worry, that's us. Um, so there's a lot of um, artillery being fired. Um, I can't thank them enough. They were amazing during the beginning of the war. Um, but where we were, we had, you know, if you live in the middle of Israel, you have like a minute and a half to get to a bomb shelter. Where we were staying, Iron Dome isn't even active. There's not enough time, it's eight seconds. You have eight seconds to get the shelter. So there were times, you know, where middle of sleep, you hear the sirens go off and you have to like run out of the room across this like gravel, no shoes, you know, jump into the nearest um, bunker that we had. Um, and I mean, yeah, it was definitely nerve wracking the first couple of months. I mean, I remember when we got to Magen even, we were all just like stuffed in this little um, like guard box in the, the Shin Gimel, which is the entrance of the kibbutz, both of us sleeping on top of each other. Um, and um, I mean, yeah, it's, you know, sometimes you're just having to be in an area where there is no cover. So you just kind of like lay on the ground and hope for the best. There was one time where we were right next to Nero's and a rocket fell 20 yards away from us. Um, and we were sitting in our Hummers. We heard the sirens go off. We started running in one direction. And luckily we ran in the right direction and the rocket fell, I mean, like 20 yards on the other side of our Hummer. Um, me not being so smart, as soon as it fell, I turned around, got a bunch of rocks to the face. Um, yeah, that was, uh, you know, another one probably fell maybe like 100 yards away. So very uh, close call. And then, you know, five minutes later, we're all sitting around joking like nothing ever happened. Okay. I'll be traumatized by that. <laughs> it was definitely, uh, definitely interesting. You're literally running for your life over and over again. Yeah, it was, uh, it was like that. Um, the sirens did give me a little bit of an issue, you know, after I got released, but now I'm, I'm doing fine. And, you know, you just, like I said, you know, you get used to it, which is kind of a crazy thing to, to imagine, um, especially coming from the States where there's not, you know, there's no such thing as, uh, as that kind of worry. I mean, not since, you know, since the fifties where they were teaching people to hide under the desks or anything like that. Right? You know, I'm still traumatized when I got the tornado warning notification. <laughs> few weeks ago. Um, I'm curious, like, you're sleeping, obviously, rough. Mm -hmm. Guardhouse, 12 of you. 
how do you look after yourselves? Like you get being fed by the IDF, you know, you, you, you hitched a ride there with a guy named uh, Scorpion Desert, yeah, right? Yeah, yeah. But are they are they taking care of you at this point? You know, um, you in my yeah, people were actually extremely nice. There was I had a um, I wish I knew what the acronym stood for. If any of the Israelis here know it, but for the SAP, the SAP, the SAP, no. So the SAP in, my, in the army is basically a guy that handles all the logistics. Um, and I'm uh, I'm vegan, which is hard to, to do when I come back to Charleston. But um, so personally, he was helping me get a lot of food that I didn't have access to. But also, he was making sure to keep morale high that a bunch of the guys were. I mean, we were having you know there was a bunch of civilians coming setting up cookouts for us at least once a week, you know, high quality meals, different things. So, um, so feeding us very well. I mean, the country was really united for, uh, for the beginning of this war, everyone trying to come and help out wherever they could. Um, so in terms of food, we were, uh, we were definitely well fed. I actually was able to actually put on a couple of pounds, uh, my first couple of months. So, and what about like, Showers, that's what I keep thinking about. Like, the Ooh, showers. be honest, be honest. Be honest. Yeah. Showers, okay. Um, are you going to random people's houses in a kibbutz and just using their shower? No, we were not allowed to do that. Um, we were so when we got to the kibbutz, we were actually staying in another kindergarten, but they just happened to have a shower. So, there was one shower for 85 people. <laughs> yeah, you can imagine what that's like. Um, and that was very interesting to say the least. Um, but there were times where um, you're on Konanut, which means your team is the ready team, which means you don't have the option to shower. You don't have the option to take off your uniforms. There was a period of uh, two weeks where my team was the ready team. And man, my clothes uh, were, were definitely abysmal at that point. Um, I mean, taking off my boots, I could clear the room. <laughs> so that was like two weeks you just had to be ready to yeah, just go yep yeah, yeah, two weeks um just you know on um uh, on madim on uniform the entire time uh, the most you can do is maybe like unbutton your shirt when you go to sleep um i made the mistake of like keeping my pants down one time and there was a rocket and i was like waddling to the <laughs> to the shelf <laughs> <laughs> Now, and, and does this like take a toll on you? You become like, you must be exhausted just mentally. Just... I mean, I went through very hard training in the army. I was in a special forces unit, so our training was a year and two months, where everyone's training is regularly seven months. Um, so I mean, I just kind of put myself back in that place mentally, and just you know, I mean, it's a war. There's people going through way worse. People that have lost loved ones. So, I mean me not being able to shower for a week or two that's like so little compared to what everyone else is going through <laughs> and how do you pass the time when you're on yeah duty man um a lot of sudoku um you allowed phones we were allowed phones not when we went into gaza itself but when we we're going on uh patrol duty and you know around the border we allowed phones that's how i was able to document um some things very well i also brought with me disposable cameras um so i have a bunch of um which i have more film that's being developed right now i have three cameras that i left in israel to be developed i should be getting filmed back from those soon um Pass the time, you know, just talking to your team, telling stories, you know. Um, I mean, just regular things, not, not anything, you know, crazy. I, when we were in Magen, we did have access to uh, to a TV for a little bit, so I decided to uh, we watch a couple of shows that, you know, between the guard duties and stuff like that. So, because I, I remember thinking during that entire month when they didn't go into Gaza at all, I remember thinking, like, we were like on edge. And, just go in, like, as we were all thinking. I was like, the soldiers must be feeling at times a million. Like, they're there. I assumed they're a little bit scared, but you want to go in? Yeah, we were really pushing to go in. Um, we were trying to, you know, figure out any way possible things that we could do, um, what kind of our messy ma, our mission um, was. When we finally got called in, you know, we were very excited. We didn't go for that long. Um, 
But yeah, I mean, the past of the time, I mean, there, you know, like I said, we had that TV, there was access to news, but the news was just super depressing. And, you know, um, it's not what you want to see all the time, especially, you know, everything like building up and, and uh, all the live updates, all the people that have uh, passed away, soldiers and civilians alike. But I do want to ask you, like, when you were, when you were in Gaza, you were stepping foot, you're walking around in Gaza, I unfortunately watched some of Hamas's clips because they like to document as much as they can to pretend they're winning the war. And it's extremely nerve wracking. I mean, even you see soldiers, they think they're safe. A Hamas sniper has them in the sight. And next thing you know, it's just, it's just the end. So, right. how does it feel walking around or rushing into safe, whatever you may be doing in and out of Gaza? Do you feel like you like some danger or do you feel like the surrounding army has you covered? So where we went into Gaza, the area had been cleared of civilians for a while. Obviously, we kind of wrong about that because if we had known about certain tunnels, you know, we were searching for tunnels um, in the place that we were. We were um, also trying to main, you know, to capture that main road, uh, something that I mentioned at the event, um, and. The issue is, um, you know, you don't know where all the tunnels are. So there is a little bit of like worry in the back of your mind, you know, what's waiting for us? What could be going on? Is there anyone there? Um, but again, like we had really good training. So we, um, you know, you're, you're always on the lookout. Even a friend of mine, um, Matan, that had come to Charleston right before the war, um, he mentioned one time that um, when he was on sea or when he was on patrol, he had just randomly like noticed this uh, window in a building. Um, he remembered it being open, and then he went back like thirty minutes, an hour later, and then he saw it closed. And we knew that we didn't have any troops there, so we called in a strike, and there there were a couple of people that had showed up and, and kind of like were were in that building, kind of waiting. Um, but I mean, again, it's just you know, having your your. I mean, when you're when you're there, your focus is is at ten. You know, you're trying to to look out for anything you possibly can, make sure you know there's nothing waiting for you, nothing. You, but again, there's you know, there's just some things that you can't plan for. There's some things that no matter what what precaution you take, um, you know, you can't uh, you won't be able to catch it, which is unfortunate. Um, drones have been very helpful during the war. Because um, we can clear buildings and possibly find um, bombs that might be rigged to blow once you enter them. So that's been really helpful. They have dogs as well. The dogs are good, but they can't um, sense anything above shoulder level. And they, and Hamas knows that. So they'll hide, you know, a bomb, like a remote detonated um, explosive higher up so the dog won't smell it or see it and then as soon as you enter the building they'll just set it off yeah boring <clears throat> yeah and i remember seeing videos of those tunnels again from the Hamas side they're just kind of it could be a little hole in the ground they pop out right next to a tank run over literally yeah. put explosives on it um and it just felt like they're like little rabbits like you could pop out of anywhere yeah that was a big worry for us and you know my team is um what's called seven new which is um we're also a part of the logistics and we ride around on Hummers a lot, which makes my job a lot easier because I'm a heavy machine gunner. So instead of having to carry it around all the time, I can just mount it on the Hummer and sit up there. Um, but yeah, it was definitely, it was definitely worrisome, you know, going in and you, we were always, um, when we moved in convoys, my Hummer was always the first one. So we're, going in basically like i have to make sure as well as like my commander and the driver with us to like we're the first ones trying to look out for everything and when you're going in at night like we were doing even though i had night vision i had a singular night vision goggle so it only goes over one eye so one eye is blind and the other eye is trying to you know kind of keep as much as i can you know this like 360 from this turret on the top of this um hummer and trying to see whatever i can see if there's anything suspicious but uh and, you know, as the days passed and more buildings got destroyed in Gaza, it became uh, increasingly harder and harder to do. 
I actually heard that they, that they like to do a lot of fighting at night because of the night vision capabilities which Hamas don't have. So could they have an advantage, is that true? Um, from what I understand, yes. I mean, Hamas is very limited in their capabilities. In terms of what weapons they have, I know that they carry AK-47s. I know that they have improvised explosives. Um, but in terms of night vision, I don't think they have a lot. It's mainly whatever they're able to get from Iran. Iran gets from Russia. So it's a lot of um, older materials. I mean, they were even... They, in the beginning of the, or not the beginning, a couple months into the war, when they were running out of materials, they started digging up water pipes to turn into rockets. The water pipes that Israel had put there. Just, just pivoting a little bit, I don't know exactly when you were going in and out of Gaza, but I often thought about, like, you know, the, the context of, will there be a deal, will there not be a deal? It's pretty much been the news for the last year. Um, and there was one deal, but it came pretty fast and it was done. Right. Um, and I know that everybody waits anxiously, and every every day the news are just dramatizing it. What happened? What didn't happen? Does that affect the, the morale of the soldiers? Um, or how they act in Gaza? Or it it definitely can. I mean, Israelis are a very argumentative bunch. So especially this last deployment we had, there was a lot of um, controversy over the next moves of the government, and especially my team. You know, I remember there was this like. We're all sitting in, in a room talking, and you know, we're all friends, but it's just like one guy yelling at the other, like, no, you don't know what's going on. No, you're an idiot. No, you're, you know, so it's, um, there's people that are very pro BB, there's people that are anti BB. So, but um, I mean, one thing that we all want is this war to be over as soon as possible and for the hostages be, to, to be returned um, by whatever means um, the government deems necessary. So, um, can affect morale, um, but it wasn't the main thing that was, you know, driving whether we had a good or a bad day. Um, from from your experience with uh, being there in the battlefield and, and seeing soldiers and firing guns and all that kind of literally what you'd call like Call of Duty violence in real life, like does that change people? Like, what does that do, do to a to a person? Like, I'm so far removed from the idea of, you know, I'm scared to. Kill a spider, you know what I mean? Okay. How, how does it, how, what does that do to someone? Um, I mean, that's, you know, maybe a, a question for someone who's been in a little bit more combat heavy experience than me. Um, I mean, we did experience some casualties for sure, um, and definitely some, some fighting, but not as intense as other people have gone through. Uh, I do have a friend, I'm not going to mention a name, that <clears throat> during his time in Gaza actually, um, um, was able to eliminate three um, Hamas, <coughs> Hamas operatives. Um, he's been dealing with that in his own way. I know that everyone, you know, from the um, from just the constant rockets have, you know, developed some kind of like small form of PTSD. Um, and I mean, if it changes you, I guess uh, a little, but I mean, <laughs> definitely puts things into perspective as well. Um, you know, problems that were, it seems big before, uh, turn out to be very little. And, um, you know, it, 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 it makes you want to be more, you know, in the present, cost, you know, rather than constantly worrying about what's going to happen you know, tomorrow or next week or the next month. Um, I don't have much time left, but I, I do want to get to one of the big questions I want to ask you. Obviously, one of the more traumatic episodes was when you literally had to dig out fallen soldiers. Um, what, what question I had in my mind was, why were you the first unit there? Because you were called to go there, or because there were, because so, you weren't a paramedic? Yeah, yeah. No, 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 no. Not yet, no. no. Um, so, you know, let me get set before this, so I don't want to call them. By the way, feel free to cover this as little as you need. Yeah, I'll go, um, I'll touch the surface a little. Um, Okay, late January. Um, we were going up patrol for eight hours. Uh, it was supposed to be from 4 p.m. to 12. Um, we had maybe been on patrol for like 15 minutes. We get a call from our Mempe, which is, I believe it's Italian League. I'm still not sure. I know what it is in Hebrew. I don't know what it is in English. I'm sorry. Um, Telling us that two, we were in charge of, 
basically moving um, injured soldiers in and out of Gaza um, during different operations. So we had already pulled out of Gaza and there was two houses that were said to be demolished. We had helped other soldiers that had been hurt before get out of Gaza. There was one, um, there was one episode where Hummer flipped over. We had to transport those soldiers. There was one episode where another soldier in our, in our dude, uh, I'm sorry, I don't know what dude means in uh, English, but in uh, platoon, maybe? I'm not really sure if one of these Israelis wants to jump in. Um, he got shrapnel in his head that wrapped around the beginning of his skull and came, it didn't come out the back, it's still there. Um, but he's since then has relearned how to uh, how to uh, walk and he had some difficulties using the, the left side of his body. That was when we were in Gaza. Um, this episode with the, with the houses, so basically we were on patrol basically anything that happens we have to go in right away um we got called we were told that there was an explosion there was two soldiers hit by an rpg that was all um but to get to the border as fast as possible so three minutes later we're at the border um and usually there's a protocol where you have to wait for permission from the lookouts and then you can go into Gaza. that was completely void they let us go directly in. We went in with our Magad and our Mempe. They were in their Defenders, um, which is like a, an armored Land Rover. Um, and we were in the Hummer. So we get in. Um, we get about three, 400 meters in. We get stuck because the sand is so loose and the, um, the, the tanks absolutely destroyed roads and they create these big ruts so when they stir up a lot of sand so all the sand wasn't packed the hummer got stuck so we got out and we started running in by foot um we're carrying uh stretchers with us and by the time we get in there's gunfire all around there's explosions going off we don't know what's happening there's still smoke and fire burning from the, the buildings that just collapsed. And that's where we got updated. Okay, there wasn't two soldiers shot by RPGs. Um, and this is no longer a rescue mission. This is just like a retrieval mission. Um, so what had happened was there was two houses, separate demolition. Um, all the charges were rigged. And then from a tunnel nearby, two Hamas operatives came out, shot that one house with an RPG, all the charges went off. And so charges from one house went off and subsequently the explosion chart uh, caused the other house to right next to it to go off. So 21 people inside instantly crushed by the buildings. Um, so running in there and having to do all of that, you know, we're under this building that at any moment, I mean, you feel like if you move a rock, the thing is just gonna crumble on top of you. Um, we were just in there trying to find any, you know, piece of life or anyone that was uh, that was underneath. Um, unfortunately, there were some people that we saw that we weren't able to retrieve, um, which was very upsetting, just because there is two big pieces of the building on top of them. You couldn't really get to them. There wasn't any way to structurally, you know, you know, none of us are supermen, so there's this immense weight on top of them and you can't get them out. Um, and uh, we were able to get to get three out um, from my building. From the other building, they were able to get another six out. Um, and yeah, I was able to, you know, uh, participate in that and carry them out in the stretchers to um, this little not the little folks that we had this little uh, like area for the for the bodies um and yeah it was uh if anyone knows anything about israeli military history it was the worst i don't want to word this it was the most amount of casualties in a military operation since Iwa missile came which is the helicopter crash that happened in the early 90s um 
it's definitely hard to, to see that and go through that. Um, it's not, you know, I'm, I'm not going to get deep into the details because, you know, there's just things that wouldn't do anyone any help here to, to hear about. Um, but it, uh, yeah, it, uh, that, that's something that, that definitely, uh, changes you and it definitely, um, you know, it's, it's upsetting because you see these guys that, you know, I served with, I lived next to for a month and a half and again, and they thought they were just going in for regular mission, you know, in and out, um, very fast and, uh, no, and they, and they lost their lives. It was very sudden. It was very upsetting. Um, you know, the week after following, we, we went to the ship of service with their families and you know, we honored them when we got out of the reserves. But, um, you know, it was very hard to, to go through that and, you know, hear about them and, uh, learn about their lives. And, um, I didn't know any of them personally, but, you know, I know that they were all based on what their family said and what their friends said about them. They're all great guys. And, um, yeah, it was, uh, it was a terrible, terrible, terrible loss. Um, definitely the worst night of my life. Um, but it, it also made me realize, you know, what I'm fighting for and, you know, just making sure that nothing like that can ever happen again. So, so yeah. Thank you. One last thing. I, one thing that fascinated me when I hear stories like this is, is that the approach that the soldiers often take is, and even sometimes the family members of those that pass away, mm -hmm. they say, you have to finish this war now because otherwise all of these deaths were in vain. Mm -hmm. and the, the same thing applies. I think there's been 348 soldiers that have been killed in Gaza mm -hmm. since they went in. Mm -hmm. And it's unbelievable to see that sort of level of resolve. And I can imagine that everybody who's in contact with such a situation is traumatized, but still to hear people say that, this is not a reason to stop. Mm -hmm. Instead, this is a reason to, to finish the job. Have you seen that sentiment? Or? Oh, absolutely. I mean, they didn't discourage us from going in at all. I mean, you know, and, and the army has been very on top of it. Um, I mean, we, we met with a therapist the next day, and subsequently when we got out of reserves, we also had, um, but if anything, it put a, I mean, yeah, it, like I said, all this fighting and all of this um, defending, it, it puts a lot in the perspective. Um, so to be able to go through something like that, not the other side. Um, I mean, we've been doing everything we can to, to get back. We've, you know, tried talking to other units to see if they can take us so we can spend, so we can go back into Gaza um, or possibly go up to the north uh, into Lebanon. So, you know, me and my team, we're, we're trying our hardest to, to do as much as we can for the country because, you know, we've been trained properly and we have the ability and, um, you know, we believe that if we can, you know, we, we must, if you, if you have the ability to do something, you, you should. Um, and if any actions that we can take, you know, would help bring this war to an end sooner than absolutely. Thank you. One last thing. What do you say to, an, you know, a young teenager who's looking at you and thinking, should I join the army? Should I join the IDF? The you know, because you went voluntarily, you didn't have to. Right. You know, even though you did Aliyah, you didn't. You went scripted. Mm -hmm. um, what would you say? I mean, my my decision was a lot different. I I joined the army through Green Sabar, um, which is an organization that helps people become lone soldiers. Um, so obviously, my take on it is uh, is different. I'm not in the business of, of convincing anyone to do it or not to do it. Um, it's really um, it's really them, you know, I, I do tell people, if you do this, it's going to be probably the hardest thing you ever do or go through in your life. Um, but it's very fulfilling. Um, but each person it's, you know, it's their own decision whether they want to do it. And if they want to rate, and if not, you know, I don't judge anyone for not doing it because it's, it's not for everyone. Um, but I do believe in, in helping Israel, like you said, you know, it's, it's our homeland helping any way that we can, um, whether you know, that be donating money, going there and, and picking vegetables. Um, so that's been a, a big, um, a big moment for volunteering this year. A lot of people coming and helping out the farmers in the South. 
Um, but I mean, any little thing that you can do, you know, even just if you if you know anyone who's Israeli or living in Israel, you know, sending them a message, checking up on them. I mean, you know, there's 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 no lack of uh, support and help that you can give, and it means a lot, of, you know, to people to know that you're thinking about them and that um, you know you're praying for them. So really, um, whatever you have the ability to do, like I said with my team, you know. If you can, you must. So really, you know, just, um, I love the Charleston community. It's a very generous group of people, very, you know, whenever something bad happens, we don't tear ourselves down. We only come back together and, you know, we unify and, and that's really great. So, um, so yeah, I mean, that's what I would, that's what I would say, you know, I mean, anyone that wants to draft, if you want to, great, but if not, um, you know, help any way you can and, uh, and do yeah, do whatever it takes. Thank you, thank you, man. but thank you for your service. Your bravery is commendable, and I, I think it's been a pleasure to some extent. I think we all feel that we've been a part of a journey from when we got those first messages that we need to give money to to raise funds for ceramic vests and all those things. We we try to do what we could. It's, uh, it sounded crazy to us, but we were honored to be a part of it, and we're so glad to see you back here, happy, healthy, and well. And we really appreciate what you did. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. I'm very thankful to all of you. So I appreciate appreciate everyone that came out, especially on such a little notice. Um, I'm sorry if I'm kind of all over the place. You know, I didn't really know uh, everything we'll be discussing, but um, it's been great sharing it with you. My experiences. If anyone has any other questions, I'm more than happy to. Um, if anyone wants to see any pictures, I'm not gonna put it on Brandon to give them to you, but I will. Uh, I'm, I'm I'm planning on I'm putting something out there very soon. Everything that I've collected uh, over my past uh, over the past year. Um, but yeah, but thank you to all of you. Really, um, your support. You know, whether it's been money, messages. You know, just saying you're you're saying a prayer for me. It, it really means the world. Um, so thank you. Okay, we're gonna say some to him now. Yes. Fanny should know we'll be mentioning you by name almost every day in the synagogue here. Because when we pray for the soldiers, we don't just pray for the general soldiers, we, we named you when you were when you were there. Appreciate it. So if you'll please rise, you might have to share with somebody and please turn the page to page number six, chapter one twenty one. So we'll say a chapter of Tehillim, followed by a Mishaber for the hostages and a Mishaber for the idea of soldiers. Uh, if you'll repeat after me verse by verse. Shalom Alois, Esai Naya Le Arim, and may I know by Ezri. Ezri, may I know you say, Shalom Bara. Ali, Tayla, my track, Lecha, Alionum Shemrecha. In a lion, the Laishan Shemer Israel. And no shamer at her, and no itiraha, and Yadiminaha. Yamam has shamers, we are caca, we are at my lila. And in a Ishmar Hami, Kara Ishmar is not shaka. Amen. <laughs> Say Mishabek for the IDF, we will include some of the names of local and known soldiers. Mishabek, I was saying, I'm going to stop Yaakov, Yvarch, S. Chaylet, Vaganal Israel, Bless, Shmuel Yaakov, Ben Rezel, Chaya. Yonatan Lev, I'd rather than the Hebrew names. No, I mean, Yonatan Den Sasha, some other Binyamin, I don't know his parents' names, and Gedalia Ben Saka.
Yeah. Oh, oh, yeah. Keep back and find out. Thank you.